Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Tamara Autumn. I'm from the State Library. Um, and welcome to today's topic talk, which is called Shared Learning, Providing Trauma-Informed Services in Small and Rural Libraries. Um, so recently, uh, the State Library helped several um, librarians from rural and small libraries attend a four-week Info People course which was called Providing Trauma-Informed Services in Small and Rural Libraries. Um, and so I've invited them here today to kind of talk about what they learned and, and share with all of us. Um, I'm going to ask them to do some brief introductions real quick, and then I'm just going to get into asking some questions. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat while we're going along. I'll also pause between questions and work on answering those questions, or you can unmute yourself and ask questions. The idea is that we all learn from one another. Um, pretty informal. So I will start by asking our panelists to introduce themselves briefly, name, library, and your position. So I'll go ahead. I'm looking at Jackie. So I'm going to start with you. Hello, everyone. I'm Jackie Mills. I am the library director at Mount Angel Public Library um, in the Willamette Valley near Salem. And um, my the city population is about 3,400. So Pretty small and pretty rural. Thanks, Jackie. Laura. I'm Laura Kimberly. I work at the Newport Public Library and I'm the library director. And our population size, we're also small and rural. We're on the Central Coast is around 18,000 people, depending on what time of year. <laughs> pretty small right now, probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy Street. I'm the library director at the Oregon Trail Library District, which is in um, Morrow County. We have three branches, Boardman, Irrigan, and Hepner. Our service area is about 10,000, but um, Boardman's the largest, and then Irrigan, and then Hepner. Hepner's definitely smaller. Um, if you look at it in sports, you know, like how big the high schools are, Hepner's 1A, Boardman and Irrigan are 5A. Um, so there's a big difference. And um, I'm a member of ARSL, so my scholarship for this Info People was um, through ARSL, so that was good. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, Deneen. I'm figuring out how to unmute myself. I'm Deneen Routenstraw. I'm the director at the Enterprise Public Library in Enterprise, Oregon. Um, according to the state library, the, our population served as a little over 3,000. Um, the population in Enterprise, which is our tax base, is around 1,700. Thanks. And Sarah. I am Sarah Tierney. I'm the librarian at the Jufer School Community Library, so it's kind of a unique situation there. Um, our population base is about 800 people. Great. Thank you, everybody. I think I had one more panelist, Ryan McGinnis, but I think he might be a little late. So if he comes, we'll let him join right in. Um, otherwise, we'll get started on our first question. And I just opened this up to any panelist, so jump on in. And if no one talks, then I get to call on somebody. <laughs> um, but you were introduced to ways library staff can work together to stay engaged and healthy while frequently working with people who have experienced challenges, suffering, and trauma. How can you see this working in your library? I'll, I'll go different. first. Is that okay? Um, at our library, I wasn't quite sure how it would work. We don't have a large population of um, people experiencing homelessness. We're in our area that's recognized. Um, there are definitely people, but they're not recognized as um, being here. Um, but right away, we had an incident at one of our libraries, and I um, was able to use the information from the training primarily for the staff member that was becoming um, very overcommitted, just like we learned in the training and how to prevent burnout and how not to take it personally and take it home with you. So. Um, I was able to share information and work with that individual as she, you know, contacted some um, agencies to help the person, but uh, I was able to help her rein back her involvement and not take it personally herself. Thanks. Denine, I think you wanted to say something. I thought it was really relevant to what we do here and um, I really enjoyed it. And 
was able, we, I finally have another staff person, so I was able to share it with her. But we have a lot of people who come here because they have various issues. And this is sort of like an isolated place for them to hide. And also they want to be connected, but they don't want internet, they don't want TV. So they use the library a lot to take care of their electronic needs. And so we get some pretty shaky folks. But when you I've been doing this a long time, but for the young lady that we've hired, I think it was really fun to watch her think about it differently, that they're not just a threat to her, which sometimes they are, but that there's a reason why they behave like that. And if you stop and think about how they're processing everything, then it makes dealing with them a lot easier. So I thought it was really good. So. There we go. So I think um, what we're talking about is compassion fatigue, correct? And basically, um, which can occur whether or not you're dealing with somebody who's necessarily trauma, um, trauma, I don't know what the word is, but, um, you know, just dealing with the public and definite, you know, difficult people. Um, I just had one this morning. <laughs> And, you know, so one of the things I do as a director is I'm, I'm just really intentional about checking in with my people, especially after um, a difficult interaction, um, just seeing how they are, especially these days. I mean, everybody's stressed. So you just, you just check in with them, see how they're doing, ask them, you know, what are you doing to take care of yourself? Um, I also frequently give them treats nothing big, you know, just a can, a little candy or something, you know, a cookie I baked or whatever. Um, today we totally lost power. It's like a mess at work. And so I bought them lunch because it's just frazzly. Um, but I think we also celebrate everything, anything, you know, if there's something to celebrate, we celebrate it. Um, we also debrief after a challenging um, interaction, you know, could we have handled that differently? And especially after this training to see how we maybe could have navigated it um, in a different way. And that helps us in the future. So, you know, kind of thinking through, um, thinking through how to handle situations like that. And um, I also really try to give them the tools they need. Um, I think when, you're, when you feel like you have, you're prepared, it's a lot less stressful. So for instance, cheat sheets that like, okay, this is when somebody's upset because we're closed right now, this is what you can say, this is how you can say it. So giving them tools um, is really helpful as well, so. Those are some of the things I do and some of the things I've learned from the, from the sessions that we were in. One of the things that's really unique for me is I'm a one person library there. I don't have employees. I don't. So it is my reaction to the person that's coming in. And so that's something that I'm constantly reminding myself of is, okay, stop. This is your reaction. You don't need to react to them. You can help them. You have resources at your fingertips. Use that. Don't react. And in Newport, we've kind of got this weird situation here where we don't have day shelters or anything set up, especially during COVID, where people have anywhere to go. And our library is considered Newport's living room. And so we're having. Um, seen a large number of individuals who are looking for resources that might be available. So we started putting together resource lists. We were doing this before, but we've been staying on top of updating it and then talking to some of the different organizations in the community to see what services that they're offering right now, um, especially because we get phone calls too from the public that'll ask about food pantries. I'll ask if um, we have 
they have it's normally a day shelter grace wins what services that they're offering having that information has been really good and then kind of piggybacking on what jackie had said about giving them the tools that they need um, to be successful with like trainings so like i touched base with my staff about this training and what i've learned but also touching um, base with them about the ryan dow trainings because there's a lot of good information about people first language and reiterating that and then we usually have little points that we keep that'll be helpful when we're dealing with difficult situations um, and also sharing that because we have security here sharing that information with them and making sure that they know how to use people first language um, that we don't need them to take this hard line approach sometimes like you'll see with law enforcement like you need to yeah the instance we had, um, I did contact law enforcement because um, there was some items left behind that I didn't want to throw away because I, I thought the person would want them back. Uh, and it was so um, great that this law enforcement person from our sheriff's department was using people first language and had the same um, hopes that we did of like, let's not throw his sleeping bags away, you know, let's get them hooked up with some because we have no shelters in Morrow County. Let's get them hooked up with Umatilla County. Um, another thing that I took away from the training was self-care for staff. Uh, I've really always pushed for that and modeled it, <laughs> modeled it myself that you need to use your sick days, you need to use your vacation days. It's really important to have self-care. Um, and so I, I uh, had a discussion with the board regarding the time between Christmas and New Year's. We would have been open three days to the public. We chose to close those three days as a precautionary against COVID um, spreading and as a self-care for our staff that's been really stressed this year. And we closed and had those as staff PTO. Thank you all, this is great. Um, I have a couple of follow-ups first. I'm sorry, I was remiss. I sort of started with the assumption that everyone knows what a trauma-informed approach is, and I think I should cycle back <laughs> for a second. Um, does any of you want to jump in and just say maybe briefly what a trauma-informed approach means and who we're talking about when we talk about um, difficult patrons or, or people that we're dealing with who may have a trauma basis? I think for myself, my definition of trauma-informed um, communications and, and, and people and information is almost everyone you meet. Um, it's not just people experiencing homelessness or people um, having a meltdown. It's everybody and it is all ages and it's staff and the patrons and vendors and everybody. Um, for myself, I was already aware of the ACEs study, the adverse children experiences study, is that right? Um, I was already aware of that, but it would surprise me how many people in our profession that took part in the training were not aware of it. Um, yeah, and, uh, and so uh, I have taken that approach. And it, it's interesting to have discussions with people after the training and with um, family members after the training about how we all perceive people's reactions and how we can look at it differently with empathy and compassion. Does anyone want to add to that? I'm just, I'm just going to quote from my favorite article from the training and it, it says a trauma, a trauma informed approach to our work realizes that every choice we make, every interaction we have, every policy we create they all have the potential to be re-traumatizing or healing for our patrons and each other. And um, like, I'm not sure, I think it was um, one of my, my colleague at Newport, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, but um, you know, talking about the Ryan Dowd training and how this is just, it just goes hand in hand because it's basically treating people with respect um, and trying to, um, I mean, this is kind of a later question, but the the most the the best tool that I got was to change my thinking from what's wrong with you, which I do when people start getting in my face, to um, what do you need and and how 
you know, um, to realize that people usually when they react like that, it's not because of me, it's because of, you know, their experiences. And I, like Kathy said, I, the, the ACEs or the ACE study was so enlightening to me. I'd never heard of that before. But when you, when you think about the ACE study, 67%, isn't that what it was? 67% have at least one trauma in their childhood. And most, you know, even, you know, a really high number um, have more. So, you know, and it does affect how people live and how they react to things. And so, yeah, the last thing we want to do is re-traumatize them. Um, so that was a helpful motivation for me. Thank you. And that's actually a perfect segue into the next question, but I'll wait for a minute. Does anyone who's not on the panel have any questions so far? I didn't see any in chat. If not, the next question is, what's one way you might integrate knowledge of trauma into your library's services, programs, policy, and or practices? And I'm guessing in order to, to re-traumatize people like Jackie was just talking about. I think one of the things that's super important is to show that you are inclusive, you know, from your collection development to your programming, that you truly are inclusive and that you support anybody who's going to walk through your door. It is a safe place. It might not be the place to live, but it is a safe place for that for people to come. I, I thought it was really interesting when our um facilitator asked about the policy about not sleeping in the library. And she said, why is that policy there? And I was like, well, because you don't sleep in the library, <laughs> but, but it is kind of interesting to think about policies in light of, okay, this person feels safe here and feel, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's a balancing act, but it was very enlightening to me to think about policies that might be re-traumatizing to people um, or traumatizing to people and um, think about ways that um, is it a is a policy necessary? Is it a barrier? Does it cause trauma? And if it is it absolutely necessary? So I thought that was that was a real um, enlightening point in the training for me. Yeah. That point really made me stop and think when she said, if an adult is asleep, how is that different from a baby that's asleep? Where do you draw the line as to who can sleep in the library and, and feel safe that that's somewhere they sleep? And the, the other part that really hit home to me was, why, where will they put their belongings if you don't let them bring them in the library? And that's their comfort and their safety. And um, <clears throat> those, those two issues have caused me to think a lot. Um, I also th think that, um, like Sarah said, collection development. Um, I think sometimes the easy path to take with collection development is um, popular authors, not any um, subjects that might be um, cause people to think or cause could be triggers. Um, but we need to have those for the people that want them. And then um, use discretion when uh, we're working with people that want that information and perhaps having a list that we could just hand someone without ha them having to say, how many books do you have about child abuse? But you know, they perhaps don't wanna say that out loud. I would chime in about um, what Sarah had said about the policy and collection development and programs. Like I got one of the ideas that I kind of walked away with is we have a large um, unhoused population here in Newport and some of, uh, some of these individuals have mental health struggles. Um, seeing if we could do like a program instead of like book a librarian, book a social worker for an hour once a month. Um, but trying to make that connection. But right now our building's closed. So how do you do that? Zoom, 
but do they have the technology to be able to do that? And that's another barrier. Um, yeah. But definitely when they were talking about the sleeping, <laughs> that struck a chord. And then where are you supposed to put their items when they come in? And then part of it's like the, the space issue too. Where do you set up something like that too? And then finding funding to be able to provide that opportunity because you want to be inclusive. Yeah, it's, it's really um, the space issue and the safety issue. I mean, you can't mm -hmm. have it in, in, you know, egress, um, places you can't have it in people's ways but um, and for small libraries it is an issue about space I mean I don't I don't really have any place to put stuff um, but I have to tell this story because this uh, reminded me that what Kathy was talking about reminded me of the in the training um, when my son was in high school he went on a um, mission trip to New York City and they did a they worked in a church where, where they gave breakfast to um, anybody who cut, walked in the door every morning, every morning. And it was like thousands of people. And my son was, his job was to be the valet of the carts that they pushed because they will not leave them because that is everything they own. And so they felt safe enough that you're going to watch my cart. And, and it was, it's important to remember that. I mean, that that's everything that they own and they're not going to leave it. So how do we accommodate that? But it is tricky when you're a tiny library and you don't have the space or the funding. I don't know quite how to handle that, but. And now COVID too, because you have to watch people's items too on top of that. One layer I hadn't thought of and was in a small community as a solo librarian or maybe two librarians, you know the individuals quite well as they were coming in as children. Now that when they're adults and they're um, part of the population that come in the library that need um, some information on you know, help and agencies and what they can do, uh, to disconnect personally and not take it personally. Like I knew that, you know, that patron when he was a little boy and I've always helped him and now I need to take him home. You know, uh, how to learn to set the balance. And this kind of goes with that self-care also where we have to disconnect and make sure we are taking care of ourselves. But librarians are less intimidating because we don't wear a white lab coat or we don't have an expectation of them earning a specific grade in our class. And so people do tend to unload more, I think, on us than they would on their doctor or their teacher or the principal or, you know, kind of more of an authority figure. Denine, did you have anything you wanted to add? I was just going to the chat room to say how much I agreed with her, absolutely. Because we make it a safe place and that they know that they can come here and they can be safe, they also feel like they can come here and talk about things that they need to say. Um, we're, I think we're really lucky because I'm connected. I used to work um, with human services. And so I know all those people in all those offices. And so, um, and we're close by. And I, I mean, if I needed to some, I could have somebody just come here, you know, and help someone. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm actually the joke at our house is librarians are just bartenders without the booze. I like that. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> I well, and have you noticed like in the era of COVID, like people just want to talk? I mean, I can't, you know, I'll bring out a book to somebody and they just. Choo, 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 choo. <laughs> I was going to ask a couple of you mentioned people first communications. Could one of you just kind of talk about what that is, what that looks like?
for me, it's a um, reminder to remember a person's name and refer to them as a, that name or that person instead of saying, um, you know, bicycle man or, you know, that, that stinky dude or and I am terrible about remembering names. And we had a patron um, that has mental health, um, ongoing mental health uh, things he works through. And he shaved his eyebrows one day and his head and he came in and there were no eyebrows and, and no hair. And I, I don't, can't remember his name. So I started calling him eyebrow dude. And then I realized I can't do that. He's a person I need to, you know, say his name or say the, you know, the gentleman that comes and sits at that computer. Um, so for me, that's part of people first, always remembering they're a person and not their um, condition or their role in society. Making say, making sure you're saying hi and greeting them, backing up on what Kathy had said too, acknowledging that their presence when you see them, not walking by and ignoring them, like taking a moment to talk to them. I think that makes a big difference too. Well, I think technically uh, person first language is making sure that you see them as a person first, not their condition. So instead of saying an autistic kid, you would say a child with autism, or instead of saying a homeless dude, you're saying a person who's experiencing homelessness. So putting, um, you know, I, I happen to believe that language matters and how we say things matter. And, um, you know, some people would say it's PC, but I, I would say it's, it matters whether you, um, whether you see someone as a person first or their condition first. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? You all are so quiet. All right, well, <laughs> we'll move right along. So next question uh, to the panelists, how might you now go about identifying potential community partners to support a trauma-informed approach? Do you have specific partners in mind? Laura, did you have a partner in mind for your book, A Social Worker? Yes, we have a crisis slash triage department from Health and Human Services, and I've got a name that I want to go talk to to see if they would be open um, to this idea and maybe start it on Zoom once a month. Um, but then part of it's the technology too. Like we have Wi-Fi in the parking lot, but we don't, we're not checking out tablets or computers yet. Like that's the next step that we're trying to get to. So how, how do you reach the people who need these services the most? That's like the next big thing. And then part of our struggle here is language barrier too. We have a really large uh, Guatemalan community here and they don't speak Spanish. They speak Mayan, which is a written language, not, or it's a spoken language, not a written language. And that's been part of our struggle too. And so I had a meeting earlier this week with our Guatemalan, um, one of our Guatemalan community members to be able to connect with her so the language barrier won't be so much of an issue. But technology is the issue now <laughs> that we're trying to figure out. Um, and then Oregon Health Authority, we have represent representative here in, in the county that I can talk to too. Um, we have Grace Winds, which is kind of like our day shelter, but it's not operating like a normal day shelter to see how we can partner and um, help them provide, let the community know, because we're still doing takeout here. And that's been really popular. And we've been uh, serving a large number of our unhoused patrons, like even breaking down like the library card application, making it easier for this community to be able to check out items from the library and be able to participate in what's going on and get the resources. Um, we've created a resource list, like a food pantries where people can go for mental health services. We're working on trying to get that translated into Spanish 
and then working with our person from our Guatemalan community to see if we can get her help with that too. And then Salvation Army does a lot here, as well as our local Rotary Club to see if they would be able to help provide funding for some of these opportunities too. Those are just a few. In the past, we've partnered with the Veterans Services, which is um, a great partnership at our one location because we sh they're on the other half of the building, but they also send people to our other branches to meet um, to meet with patrons just to hang out there. And if a patron wants to talk to them, we've partnered with WIC and uh, Community Counseling Solutions, which is our counseling service available in Morrow County and with Department of Human Services and also with um, uh, oh, there's, oh, well, with the clinic, they've had people here um, for doing um, health um, signups for people for Oregon Health Plan, but there's also another one for, for rent, for um, housing, for um, agricultural-based families that we've had in the library that we've partnered with. With do for where we're located, we're only located we're located about 15 miles away from our county seat, which is a much larger larger population base. So we struggle with getting people willing to come out here. Why don't you guys just come into the Dells? Why don't you come here instead of going out there? But our city hall was really receptive when I contacted them, and they have um, a it's not it's a food pantry but it's more for feminine hygiene products or baby formula or pet food um, and then our school has a food pantry and I talked with our school counselor and said hey you know what kind of resources do you have do you have some that I can put out for our families so we're getting some resources and I'm trying to put them in a spot where they're obvious but it's not obvious what you're doing there you can go over, look around, look at the bulletin board and pick something up without being like, oh my gosh, everybody look, I'm getting a something for food. So that that's our big struggle though, is trying to get people to come to our community instead of sending our community members to some other community. And I would say um, the situation in Mount Angel is exactly the same as Sarah's. Um, we're about 20 miles from Salem, which is the county seat. That's where all the services are, and we don't have any. And, you know, it's um, one of the things from the training that kind of made me think is we do have a community college in Salem that perhaps we could get some student interns to come out, you know, social service type. I don't know if they even have a, I haven't looked, gone that far to look and see if they even have a program for, for um, that would, that would be appropriate, but that's a possibility as well. But it is hard to get people to come to us rather than expecting, you know, our, our, our public to go to them. We have no public transportation in our county. Um, there is a van, a bus that is in Irrigan that'll go to Umatilla County, but it doesn't go anywhere else in Morrill County. Um, and there's a public, there's like a um, on-demand transportation service basically for health needs. But we just recently found out if you have COVID symptoms and you're going for a COVID test, they won't transport you for that. Um, so connecting people with transportation can be difficult. I have a question about for everybody's library is like the, the system that I'm in right now, you cannot get a library card unless you have an address. But that this training made me think about, well, that's what do we do with those who don't have an address? And often they're the ones that need our services the most. Um, is there anybody in this group that allows people who don't have an address to get a library card? And how do you handle that? We have the, have any piece of ID that shows their name. It doesn't have to be a state issued ID. And um, 
we're a special district. Um, so, you know, we're not governed by a city. Um, and also our library system, um, we can just set them up so they can get items just from us and not through ILL. And mm -hmm. that's primarily, it's become more uh, requested now with hotspots, um, which are a huge need and which is why people were visiting the library to get internet. Um, so we have just left the address line blank, um, but I know some libraries have them use the library address. Um, so that's one option. Or if they, um, well, the form when I first moved here, you had to provide a personal reference that lived in the city. And so that quickly came off. Um, but yeah, it, it, it training staff that have been here since before me, that, that, that we're going to allow that has been the hardest part. Um, so it is tricky. And then you can, we can also set people up with a shorter time span of a library card. So it expires sooner. And then now with COVID, so many of us are offering more um, digital services. If they can't have a library card, then they can't access those. So just getting cards in their hands has been, um, important for us. And then Haley uh, shared in the chat that in North Bend, um, the library there issues temporary cards that are renewed each 30 days rather than once a year. And that they also have a smaller per card, per card item limit and they don't require any address for those cards. So there are some options that you could consider. That's what we're doing here in Newport uh, too. And we're trying to figure out if there's, if we could use the address for the library. So I'm glad that you mentioned that, Kathy, because I didn't think about that. Um, we're also partnering because at Lincoln County, 17% of the school age children are considered homeless here. And so we're trying to work with the Lincoln County school districts. They call it HELP. It's the Homeless Education and Literacy Project where they're providing um housing and resources for students in our district and so we're trying that's another community partner that we want to work with to help um help uh, support trauma informed our trauma-informed approach with the library too letting them know that we have these different resources available to help them i forgot to mention that Thanks. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the schools. I know, Sarah, you always have a connection with the schools, but I'm wondering if anybody else is working with any schools on some of this trauma-informed approach to services or anything. Maybe not. <laughs> Just a question. Um, Okay, uh, I will pause for any other questions from anyone who wants to ask. Okay, if not, the last question I have for our panelists. Would you be willing to share at least one resource from the course that you found particularly useful or interesting? You can do that by talking about it, putting it in the chat. Um. I think I, I kind of mentioned this, or I quoted from it earlier, but I thought the article Moving Towards Healing, a Trauma-Informed Librarianship Primer, um, it, was, it was only like four or five pages long. It was very concise. It was um, pretty complete. Uh, I mean, pretty much the first, um, it, it kind of gave an overview of our very first session. Um, and I thought it was really helpful. It was something that I could hand my staff and say, you know, I'd like to, I'd like you to read this and then we're going to talk about it. Um, and I thought, and it's something I also, oh, is that it? Oh, thank you. Cause I didn't, couldn't see who it was by, <laughs> but uh, that was a really helpful one for me. I believe that's the one I'm just madly Googling in the background here. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Jackie, you also mentioned the ACEs study. So um, I can put a link to kind of what that's about in the chat. Yeah, I, I would, um, anybody who isn't familiar with that, I think it, it would be really um, eye-opening to look at that study because, um, and then some of, there was one lady, the, the pediatrician, this was a, an optional type thing, but she did a TED talk on the A study and her talk was so amazing <laughs> and really kind of put it all in perspective, but I don't, I didn't write that one down. Let me see if I can find it while everybody else talks. I'll see if I can find it. There was another book that had been mentioned um, in the course, Verbal Judo, The Gentle Art of Persuasion. Do you guys remember being mentioned? That one being mentioned? That was another one that looked really, I haven't read it, but I, that's one I wanna read. One of the best things that I took away from the course was actually when you had to interview somebody about being trauma informed. And I interviewed a woman in our community who is a foster mom and she's fostered for in three different states, no, two different states, three different counties, gajillions of kids. Uh, right now she has three extra children in her home. And it was just, it was so amazing what she had to say. And, and some of the questions that, you know, like, what would you do if somebody offered you help when, when you were having an issue in public? And she's like, more than likely, I would tell them to get out of my face. And it's like, oh, and she said, because most people don't know how to help in, in a, when you're having an issue and things are falling apart. You know, if somebody offered to move my cart out of the groceries, out of the aisle, yes, I'd accept that help. But if they're going to help me with my child, no. So I thought that was really interesting. But then the most profound thing she said is if you treat everybody who walks in your door as if they are, they have trauma, you are 75% of the time correct and you are 100% of the time nice. I was like, whoa, that's amazing. Kathy or Denise, did you have any resources you wanted to share? No, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> um, if I did, not, I did oh. find the link to, I'm sorry, I did find the link to that YouTube. Um, it's, it's in the chat. Thank you. Well, that's all the questions I have for all of you. Does anyone else have anything they would like to share or any questions they'd like to ask? This is Deneen, and I would just like to say to the State Library and to yourself, thank you very much for making that available. Um, I have very little money for any kind of training, and that was a little bit expensive, but right now I do have the time. I can do it during regular work time, and so it was really nice to have that opportunity, so thank you very much. I'm glad <laughs> you were able to participate and found it useful. Yeah. And if you haven't done the Ryan Dowd training, that's free as well. And it's amazing. Um, I also, I, I guess I was on mute when I said this, but I did find the link to that TED talk. It's in the chat and it's, um, it's called how childhood trauma affects health across a lifetime. So um, I, I recommend that one. It's 20 minutes long and it's amazing. Jackie, what was the other training that you said was available and was free? The Ryan Dowd, R-Y-A-N-D-O-D-W-D. -D -D. He, yeah, I'll let Tamara talk about that. But the State Library has paid for us to take that training and it is really worth it. And what's really nice too is um, he, he works in the largest homeless shelter in where, Illinois or Chicago. Somewhere. Chicago, Chicago, yeah, somewhere. And um, so he he basically has created an art form on how to interact with difficult people and how to get compliance and in a respectful way. 
And, um, but what's really cool is that he sends out these little um, kind of tips every week. And then there's a webinar, is it tomorrow? That's gonna be, it looks amazing. Somebody who, um, who worked in during the Rwandan genocide will be speaking. And those are free too. And all because our state library is paying for that training. So I would, I'm just, I'm just giving a commercial to Ryan Dowd here. <laughs> And I posted the links to both the training and how to register so you can gain access. It's in the chat. And then I also just wanted to add on that um, because of the way Info People has structured and licensed yeah, yeah. their online courses, we're actually able to take that content and remix it, so to speak. And so we're going to have a niche academy version of this same training hopefully available by the end of February. So staff throughout the state can partake in it for free. Um, it will be more than likely, it'll be a self-paced um, scenario, but it's also possible, and especially if one of you would be interested, um, that we could create a cohort so people could take uh, four to six weeks to go through the same course, but um, just within a small group within Oregon. So stay tuned for announcements for that. Um, and then if you run across any training resources or have any training needs, please reach out to the State Library. We'll be happy to um, pursue those to the best of our abilities and come up with something for you. This was a great opportunity and very thankful mm -hmm. to the State Lab Library for this. I was gonna to touch on the, um, like some of the other panels that talked about the compassion fatigue and the signs and burnout. In one of the weeks we had to put a self-care plan together and how we were gonna do, I think that was really good because um, I noticed that I'm not practicing as good of self-care and this class kind of kickstarted me into practicing better self-care. <laughs> and trying to prevent burnout for myself and for the staff, just because you keep feel like you're changing something like every other day especially with COVID, because you take a step forward, take a step back, um, just to be mindful. It was, that part was really good in the course too. And Sarah, speaking of health, self-care, um, since you're by yourself, you need to find somebody that you can call and just debrief with, because so, we all need that. And if you want it to be me, that's fine, but you need somebody. Um, I also want to put a plug in for ARSL, um, the Association for Rural and Small Libraries. It is, if I go to one conference a year, it's that one. Um, it, the, it's just because we're so unique and we don't fit into um, like big libraries <laughs> stuff. Um, it's just a very helpful um, association to belong to. And it doesn't cost as much as some um, other national ones. So. Oh, thanks, Tamara. She put it in the chat. And the other thing Thank I would like State Library for this up. And the other thing I'll mention for folks, because um, sometimes even um, the travel costs can be a little prohibitive in getting to a national conference, even something like ARSL. Um, go to your friends or your foundation and see if they can help send you or one of your staff members. Because um, I know a lot of libraries, they don't have a professional development budget or what have you. But if you can make room for that somehow, even every other year or every three years, it's well worth the effort. That's, that's my favorite conference to go to, frankly. Well, I wanna thank you all, all of you panelists who participated in the course and agreed to come and talk about what you learned. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, as Darcy said, we'll be creating a niche academy with uh, this recording, the resources we put in chat, as well as other information from the course. So it will all be there and that will go out on LiveZor and various other listservs. Um, otherwise, I don't have anything else to add. Just thank you all and uh, practice some self-care. <laughs> And I'll see you later. Thanks, everybody.